Well, good morning and, and welcome back to Luke chapter 6. Last week we started on Luke's edition of the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with a satellite's eye view. In particular, we looked at the context, the ancient context of God's dealings with the young Israelites on three other historic mountains, that's Sinai and the pair of Ebal and Gerizim. And the discourse on this mount makes Jesus the second Moses and the direct fulfilment of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now, this would have been really very obvious um, and would have hit home extremely forcefully to any Jewish reader of Luke's Gospel. Um, but let's just cut ourselves a little bit of slack uh, because Luke was principally writing for a non-Jewish audience like us anyway. So if that doesn't jump out at us, um, then that's fine. Well, uh, we just learn and, and take it on board. So let's bear this background in mind, uh, though, as we look at Jesus' teaching. Now, we're examining Luke 6, and the passage is 20 to 26. So do just pause and have a little look and refresh your memory. It's a cut-down version of what's in Matthew, and there are some really interesting differences. So like Matthew, Luke starts with the blessings. Note that it's the other way around when Moses does it. So Moses begins with the woes. And perhaps this is just one of many reasons why the writer of Hebrews labels the new covenant in Jesus' blood a better covenant the covenant of which he, that's Jesus, is mediator, is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Now, before we go any further, we should just pause to ask what blessings and woes really are. What does this mean to 21st century Westerners like us lot? So, well, let's start, as indeed Luke does, with the word blessing. Blessing is a rather sort of Christian word, which isn't much used these days, except as a rejoinder of someone sneezes, or bless you, or you give money to someone begging on the street, or something like that. Or occasionally it's used uh, between Christians when parting, or as a PS to an email. Actually, its primary meaning is God's favour and approval. Now, that makes complete sense to any reader of the Gospels, or for that matter, the Old Testament. And by inference, woe is the opposite. Woe is a, a word we seldom use in English as well. As a rule, it carries very little weight. The word woe be gone, for example, means someone who's sad for little reason. Woe is me. And also it denotes somebody who's unduly sorry for themselves. In other words, it's really lost much of its force. However, scripture uses it. And when it does, it's a powerful onomatopoeic word that is a word that sounds like its meaning the greek is ooi and the old english is wa it sounds like the deep emotional distress of an inconsolable baby woe is god's profound disapproval and misfortune can be expected to follow it's a big word. So what did Jesus say could be expected to attract God's favour, his blessing? Now, it would seem pretty handy to know something like that. And likewise, what attracts his disapproval? Well, here's somewhere to start. Jesus lists four things that attract God's positive attention and four things that attract his censure. They're opposites, four positives, four negatives. 
so they slot quite neatly into the next four days this week. Here's today's musing. Some of us, maybe not just me, pretty good at dodging or turning a blind eye to things we'd rather not deal with. And if we do notice, we procrastinate. We put off acting on them, sometimes for years, sometimes indefinitely, let's be honest. If the Holy Spirit speaks to you over the next four days, could you make a change? Grace and peace.